Zadoložba Hatje Kanc in pravzaprav pogovor na temo pravzaprav socialističnega modernizma oziroma tega, rečemo, hlapnega termina in z nami pravzaprav tudi Matej Ščerik, direktor arhitekturnega muzeja. Pogovor bo, ker zaradi praktičnih razlogov, pravzaprav pogovor v teko v angleščini, Roman Bezek je pravzaprav, mislim, da rojen v Sloveniji, ampak mu gre važja engleščina, se pravi, in upam, da bo razumil. Zdaj, če kaj ne bo jasno, lahko potem bo po govoru pojasnilo. Tako da, hello everybody. So, I just announced that we're going to speak in English, because it's easier for, because we're like, which international company gathered here. So, uh, first of all, uh, uh, what I would like to ask, so how, how many photos for you, Roman, how many photos are actually in the series? I've seen, like, there are m many more photos of, of, from this series in the book. Mm -hmm. So we have around, I don't even know anymore, around 35 yeah. uh, on the exhibition. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how much material did you have, actually? Uh, from this like five year research? Oh, it's not so much more than I have in the book. So I would say I have double much more material um, than I uh, published in the book. In the book I published around 74 photographs and I don't have more than 140 because I was working very concentrated and very focused and uh, so also the way of photographing was very costly so i had to be a little bit careful with the photographing costly why uh, what's what's the technique you were yeah, using the, yeah the technique is this large format camera <coughs> with four by five inch negative and so every photograph costs you around six seven eight euros and, mm -hmm. and then you are really counting what are you doing <laughs> and what are you not doing <laughs> okay, yeah. can you imagine that? So basically, that's uh, like an analog technique. You, know? yeah. you don't, you don't really use uh, digital cameras for these purposes. In this project, not because it's a project dealing with architecture, and uh, then you have better possibilities with a large format camera to correct the perspective, and doing that uh, uh, in this analog way. But recently I was uh, started a project, I started a project which I'm shooting now digital as well. So it's not the philosophy or saying only analog way is the only way in photography. It is just a technique and not more. Mm -hmm. So also for you, uh, Mateusz, I mean, uh, actually photography is the, actually the basic way to document architecture, you know, to make documentation. So I don't know, for, for your museum, uh, is it important? For instance, I was now, we were talking about analog and, and digital. Uh, what, what is your, uh, I mean, what's the uh, main way to, to what's the, the most common way to document architecture? I don't know how, actually, and maybe you can also describe a little bit how do you document basically this real estates, you know, for, for the museum purposes? Of course, photography is uh, the most important, practically, besides the uh, drawings and sketches and uh, materials from the archives of the architects, uh, photographs that were, that were taken originally are particularly of the greater value for us, for, the, for, understanding, for the understanding of architecture. And I have to say that uh, this socialist architecture has practically been rediscovered by photographers recently, not by, by architects. Um, there is a book, um, a project that was presented in uh, like all the big uh, groundbreaking things happening in MoMA in New York, and this one happened there as well. It was in 2007 when Richard R presented a project, The Lost Vanguard. Uh, mm -hmm. And at that moment, I have to say that in a way, uh, these, are, these topics uh, became fashionable. And on the other side, 
they also became uh, a great interest of research as well. And we can seen from from this point uh, on, and I think that Roman practically started in a similar uh, at a similar moment to, to research uh, uh, through photography with architecture. Uh, but from from this point on, many projects are going on to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to try to. To, to rediscover what, what is the legacy of this period, what is the legacy mm -hmm. of this architecture from today. So what do you think that happened first? To, uh, I mean, just uh, uh, um, an opinion. Basically, it seems that first 10 years or first 15 years after the independence, Slovenia nobody was really interested in the heritage of modernist socialist architecture. Uh, Moreover, I mean, they, they even we even developed a prejudice about the socialist architecture. Why do you think it's it's coming back now? Is it just it, it, is it like uh, maybe enough time passed by, or why do you think? Of course, the time distance is important. But uh, 20 years ago, I'm sure everyone was striving for a better life and for something. Uh, that we were not used to at, at our common lives uh, in the previous times. So better commodities and uh, more choice and uh, uh, more diverse uh, environments to live in. And, and uh, that's in a way normal. And uh, with, the, with the distance of 15 years, I, I, and of course, some of these things have been demolished, and people who were aware of the importance of these architects and architecture, of the importance of this cultural heritage, have always been uh, loud uh, warning that this is a part of history and this should just not be erased. And, but uh, now I think uh, it is coming slowly into awareness, and even some of some of these buildings have even been. Listed as heritage sites, mm -hmm. what is also important, um, but it is it, it has been an enormous production. Uh, practically 70 or 80 percent of our cities is made of this mm -hmm. material. Mm -hmm. so it is really important to dig. Yeah. So what, what was your only how to protect yeah, it, yeah. but how to yeah. it? I really think that uh, this uh, time was important. The distance of time. Because um, I was asking myself why I didn't start this project 10 years before or right in the beginning of the 90s. Because then I would see everything in these pure uh, conditions. I was uh, looking for that in the cities uh, and I can't find it somewhere else because I was late. But I think uh, nobody was able to recognize the value of the architecture and uh, also the political situation were somehow confused. And I think for me, as well as uh, the generation born in the 60s, uh, it is somehow this architecture I, I uh, grew up with. So when I was a child, this uh, architecture was around me, was erased. And it's uh, for my generation also an important uh, period. And it needs the time to discover it. So you are right, many projects are starting from the middle of the zero years dealing with that topic. There, there in the last two or three years, uh, more of this project, as well as photographers. And uh, that's, that's a good quote to say that this uh, architecture was rediscovered by photographers. So that means photography can also uh, do something in a culture, cultural way. Mm. So basically your, your personal reason was some kind of maybe nostalgia or something like that. It's a, it's a mixture. I was, I was, uh, I was asking myself uh, what are the remains of the, uh, this socialistic period. And I started my investigation in uh, Yugoslavia. Because I come from Slovenia and I was always connected to Yugoslavia. Uh, in a certain way, and I was asking myself what, uh, what are the remains of Yugoslavia where, because we can't speak anymore of any homo Yugoslavicos, because mm -hmm. this, this was uh, really um, destroyed in the wars, and uh, then I came to the idea that the architecture is the connecting thing in Yugoslavia and as well 
in East Europe, of course. And so I started the investigation. And uh, there are two things uh, what I was looking for. The question why the socialism uh, wasn't successful. Maybe you can see something in the buildings of that uh, problem. That was a thesis. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure uh, if you can answer that this photography. And of course, the other, uh, on the other hand, it was a kind of uh, nostalgia, of course. It was a kind of nostalgia. <laughs> so basically, just a short question. You were born in Ptui, as far as I know. Yeah. So when, when did you move to Germany? So I moved to Germany when I was three years old. Oh, okay. On the tracks of the uh, labor migrants in the 60s. So mm -hmm. my parents went there. And we stuck somehow there in Germany. Of course, the plan of my parents was to return and to build a house and uh, to have a living here. And uh, so we grew up and went to school. and. I married and studied in Germany and uh, the first years, the first 20 years I was very much in uh, Yugoslavia and Slovenia on vacation and it was somehow also my country but now after 30 years being out of my um, home with my parents I see that is of course a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So yeah, basically I have another question for both of you. So when we speak about the modernist architecture, architecture of 60s, 70s, even 80s, um, how is, what's the difference between socialist architecture behind the uh, Iron Curtain or from Yugoslavia or on the other side on, in the Western world? Basically in, in the same period we have, have quite similar um, uh, projects, quite similar uh, initiatives, you know, also in West Germany or, or in America. Um, maybe if you start, I mean, what what is the what, what characterizes something that we can call like the modernism of socialism? I think that is not much different than with uh, modernist architecture in the West. M the main difference is that the production of this architecture, the amount of production of this architecture uh, was much larger on, on the East. And just recently when we were having many discussions now through the, the unfinished modernizations projects, mm -hmm. uh, whose some researchers are also here, yes. uh, uh, actually something that came out was that the, the original ideas of modernism, the Corbusier's ideas, for example, um, were only able to be realized in the East because um, these were these were large-scale projects that needed a lot of land, uh, a lot of cheap land, uh, uh, strong leadership, uh, and uh, that that was not able to be realized. In the market market economy. Economy. Yeah. Uh, and that's why you can actually see those concepts only behind the X eye curtain. Mm -hmm. So there is no formal characteristic of like socialist modernism except of the like the, the decoration and the iconography, but formally it's mostly the same as you said. Formally it's the same. Uh, what is the difference? Of course it's also that uh, these were economically much more deprived areas and uh, things were done uh, with uh, less means uh, and uh, technically also maybe sometimes not in as advanced as on, on the West and particularly they were, they were built and they were not taken care for later. That is also one of the problems why, um, why this architecture is stigmatized as well today because it's all falling apart practically. It, it's, uh, it's difficult to renew it and to, to, reconstruct, it, to reconstruct it. But uh, it, that does not mean that it, it, it has some value but it is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, basically I uh, have the same question for you. Uh, I actually found a, a review on the internet of, of your book when Actually, the author of the review, I think his name is Jörg Kolberg, uh, is saying that, yeah, basically you have the same buildings in also, not only in Eastern Germany, but Western Germany, and then he's mentioning the, I think, 
Boston City Hall mm -hmm. and so on and so on. So yeah. what's, what's your uh, opinion on that? What's the uh, characteristic of uh, socialist modernism? Yeah, I would agree that uh, in basically it is uh, the same. I would say that the material here in the East was different than the material, uh, or the quality of the material was uh, different, and the scale, of course. Because um, uh, when I was once in Zagreb, and I introduced my project to a curator of uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art, and immediately he asked me, uh, why don't photograph this also in the West? Why always uh, looking to the East? Of course, this uh, to compare East and West, it's, I think it's an old tradition of Cold War, and it's uh, like a dualism that, that always is, uh, uh, is um, called when, when you see something from the East, everybody is asking after the second twin uh, of the West. But uh, then I really uh, took it serious. And I photographed some uh, sites in Paris and in Marseille and in Hamburg and took some pictures from the East and mixed it and gave it to the curator in Hannover. And she is uh, originally from East Germany. And I asked her to find out where is West and where is East. And, and she couldn't. She, she's, it, it was really hard to, uh, to uh, find it out in the photograph. And uh, I, I think also my project was not to, um, to find a certain aesthetic of uh, the East um, in this architectural way. I think there is, of course, a certain aesthetic of colors, maybe also sometimes of the limited uh, sources in East have been, has uh, brought another language of forms in, into the architecture. Maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm not really an expert in that, but uh, maybe that is also a interesting topic for investigation for scientists. Mm -hmm. But I was always attracted by those buildings because, and the, the stigma uh, mentioned, uh, uh, you mentioned, is of course for the modernism. It is also in the West. But always you have the feeling there's something wrong uh, when you see this kind of building and the, the historical growth city and this modernist part is always not matching and people uh, don't like. But I think in the East there is a double stigma because it's also the architecture of these uh, socialistic uh, regimes which were now uh, overtaken and uh, not any existing more. So for a certain generation this kind of building is, is also like uh, the recalling of the power of socialist uh, period. And I think the younger people have a uh, not so uh, programmatic view on this architecture and are just looking to the forms and to the, to the houses and, uh, and not counting on the past and also not counting on the socialist period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, what I'm noticing also in the, in, in the images, it's, uh, I mean, it's not only about the, the, the architecture itself, it's also about the change, yeah. which is so sometimes very, very obvious. Yeah. I mean, I would point out like the, the, the image of Moscow and, uh, for instance, Potsdamer Platz in Berlin. It's like a typical yeah. example of that. Yeah, the, uh, the Alexanderplatz. Oh, Alexanderplatz. Oh, okay, the Potsdamer Platz is... Uh, it's new. It's new. That, yeah, it's completely that, new. It was an empty space. Yeah. yeah, it was this in between the walls mm -hmm. empty space, yes. But yeah, basically, Potsdamer Platz is probably one of the greatest architectural sites for contemporary architecture, I would say. It was a huge site that needed to be built, like in the 90s. Yeah, Berlin was a huge site to go and visit as an architecture student in the 90s. Okay. <laughs> Definitely, because there was so much going on. Uh, now, there are things and projects that are already uh, evaluated with uh, time distance as well and uh, there are some failures as well of course but um, yes what I wanted to say is that um, it is not just <coughs> great blocks and, but there are important modern concepts behind these buildings and um, the, the, it, it was simply the time where not only in the East, but also in the West, through modern architecture, new standards were set up. 
on the very many very important fields of architecture, like uh, for educational buildings, uh, how schools are built today that was established in the 50s and 60s uh, in Yugoslavia mm -hmm. through modern projects, through, uh, uh, through research, through the work of architects, teachers and uh, uh, doctors together, for example. Uh, standards in hospitals were set up with this architecture. Um, so there was a new quality of life coming in that period and that is important. Uh, and uh, the, the, the quality of services, of public services, uh, was coming better through this architecture as well. Mm -hmm. Basically, I mean, in, in Yugoslavia, I mean, the, this kind of architecture meant uh, progress, basically, you know. We have so many, for instance, in Slovenia, we have many very tiny little towns. I'm coming from one of them, like Kursko. It has 8,000 8, people, but it, it's organized anyway. It has a square, it has uh, flat areas and stuff like that. It has a school. It's very programmatic, actually, yeah. Because for any new service, you practically need a new building as well. And, uh, architecture was something necessary that has to be a part of, of this progress. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, if we talk, if I go back a little bit on the uh, modernist architecture or maybe the uh, state sponsored, state planned uh, uh, architecture. In, in the West, we have, for instance, this famous uh, example from St. Louis, Igor Prud, or Haygate Estate, which is still in London, which is still actually, uh, they, they're trying to demolish it, the, the, the City uh, Council of London, but there are people who are defending basically the whole neighborhood, which is empty now. Uh, so, in the West, they, they pronounce the, the failure of social housing. Why did that happen, in your opinion? Basically, for instance, Igor Prud was demolished in '76. Finally, uh, and then after that, there were many, many examples of demolishing, like this huge settlement. Yes, that was researched many times, but, uh, but uh, basically, it was not only a matter of architecture. It was not only a matter of wrong architectural concepts. It was uh, a matter of. Um, um, housing policies and uh, urban policies as well um, to create a ghetto it's uh, very easy to if you mm -hmm. settle all the uh, people with low income on the low, low to, to one side and uh, just and, and not raise the, the quality of other services as well so nowadays every good um, urban policy is, is aware of that you have to mix, you have to, uh, you have to practically be active in, in an area all the time. You just you can't just let it fall apart. Mm -hmm. uh, projects or sites that you mentioned are not the only one. There are many that yeah, that, have, that have many failures that happened and many many sites that have been demolished. Uh, just wiped out as a, as a consequence of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, for instance, I don't know, uh, did you ever think about, like, uh, have you ever researched this situation in the West, like the demolishing of social housing? Social housing in the West in, in the 60s, 50s, 60s was a huge thing, but then yeah. it started to fall apart. Probably because that was the story of West Germany, actually. Yeah, I don't know. It's really, really the story of West Germany, but I know the story of the uh, reunited Germany. And uh, there it was, uh, as you mentioned, we, uh, in East Germany we had a lot of these housing blocks. And the people went uh, out from East Germany more to the bigger cities or more to West. Mm -hmm. And so there were many places abandoned and they are really demolishing a lot of them. And I think it's also okay because you can't preserve everything. It's 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 really a huge amount, and it's not very uh, well uh, constructed in many cases, and so you have also to demolish. But there is uh, another example 
in um, Germany, in Berlin, was the um, uh, Palast uh, de la Republique, the Palace of Republic, which was an important uh, iconographic architecture of East Germany, uh, right in the middle of Berlin. And uh, this um, uh, Palace of Republic uh, was demolished, and it is uh, not only an architectural question, they pretend that there is asbest inside and something like that, but I'm, I'm not believing that. I think it's more an uh, ideological decision to reconstruct uh, the castle of the, of the Kaiser again. So it is uh, so, so a lash back in history. So also a denying or to, uh, try to forget or to come over the uh, socialist period and don't want to have this open <coughs> historical wound in the middle of the city, and so that that uh, building was uh, demolished, and that is uh, something what happens many times uh, with some of these iconographic um, uh, buildings in other countries. So you can say that uh, I think in, in some years uh, this uh, kind of uh, my photographs will also be a witness of a period uh, or of houses which not existing anymore. So just in the moment, there are, um, I would say, 10 of these photographs I did, the houses that don't exist anymore. And this is now some years ago only. So it's kind of like an a, a important document? Of it's a document. It's, of course, a document as well. And uh, in 50 years, maybe, it will be something Mm -hmm. Like uh, Auger, Auger also was photographing this uh, Paris, which was vanishing under modernization, and uh, that is uh, maybe the same idea, the same idea is also not intentionally in this project, but uh, time will bring it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as far as I see from your photographs, you, I mean, I could. Even the book is made in, in certain groups, actually. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so you have like the, I would say, uh, social housing, public housing, and then, then uh, public buildings. And uh, that's kind of like intentionally yeah. in the book. Yeah. So you were following, I mean, what is your experience of the, uh, this iconography, the, the programmatic ideas of, for instance, public buildings in, in, in Eastern Bloc, like the, I don't know, for instance in Minsk we have a great example of a yeah. monumental, maybe yeah. it's a parliament, I don't know what, what's, what's like actually this uh, building from Minsk. Uh, I don't know exactly which one you mean. With the, with the <coughs> little pool in front of it, I mean little pool, it's like, it, it seems like a presidential palace. Uh, I don't know exactly. Okay, I mean there are many photos yeah, here, yeah. but... I'm sorry, I can't remember. <laughs> but uh, it, when I started to photograph, then after a while I find out that there are similarities in some uh, concepts, some urban concepts. And so I started to make groups. So for instance, this kind of mm -hmm. architecture where you have these houses uh, one after the other. We call it in Germany Scheibe. So one Scheibe to the next. This I have found in many places. And so I have a group here in the book where I was photographing this kind of uh, urban concept mm -hmm. places. Or, or you have a wide, big space and you have a high-rise building and, and something like a cultural palace. That's also, I found, found this in Peran, I found this in Bratislava. And also this was another group. And uh, then I have this kind of photography I found here in Rosanna. These are somehow high-rise buildings. To me, they, it looks like uh, rockets. Mm -hmm. And then also I photographed, uh, I made a group of high-rise buildings. Mm -hmm. And so on, like always, I don't know exactly the English word for this part of the building. Because oh, yeah. this, this is always... Without like, windows, you mean. Yeah, yeah th this is always an interesting part because the decoration in these parts is, uh, differs. Here in Minsk it is uh, somehow a mixture of uh, Christian and uh, socialistic iconography mm -hmm. because the astronaut, the cosmonaut is uh, like a god in the, uh, up and then you have this free holiness and something like that. But 
Uh, also, uh, this was interesting. So, so I, I, I to make a structure in all these uh, countries and cities, I started to invent groups of uh, the photographs to to get it a little bit clearer for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Mateusz, so uh, during your research for the project Unfinished Humanizations, you, you mentioned it already before, uh, what were basically the, the, your main conclusions? You, you, I mean, uh, how did you deal with the iconography and the programs of this like socialist uh, uh, architecture? Oh, there were several conclusions. It was a large project with, uh, yeah, a, a large project with more than 50 researchers. And uh, practically, um, not everyone, but teams of four to, to five people were, were working on one research. So there were existing more or less independent research is going on. So each of them had uh, a particular conclusion for its own topic. Uh, there were, for example, let, let just count a few of them. There, there was a research about tourism on uh, Coast in Yugoslavia, on Croatian coast, particularly, and concepts presented there were going from large scale planning, regional planning, to the planning of the particular hotels. And it was clearly shown how carefully this was done uh, through uh, evaluating how many uh, swimmers one beach can take and then deciding how large hotel designs should be. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, uh, making concepts of the hotels according to the topography of the, of the coastline. So that, that was one of the researches, for example. The, the research that was uh, dealing with Slovenian architecture took particular care. Uh, Lukas Kans, he was a researcher. He, uh, uh, in a way, he discovered the, the value of Slovenian modernism uh, that or some particular issue in Slovenian modernism where construction uh, played an important role as a, as a static element. And this was only possible because uh, new waves of construction appeared at the point when this was going on. Here in Ljubljana, several buildings by Milan Mikhevich, for example, by Savin Sever. Mm -hmm. uh, Which period is that? 70s, basically, or 60s and 70s? 50s, 60s, 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. So, but um, the project itself was a kind of response to to similar projects that were going on about Yugoslavia and were trying uh, to exoticize this stuff and not. Uh, not to research it deeply. So mm -hmm. uh, this is a very valuable uh, way of documenting architecture and mm -hmm. making clusters. Uh, things can be compared as well. But uh, for, ex for example, there were projects that were trying to that were te taking a look at the territory of the former Yugoslavia as, a, as a, something very exotic and you should go there and see these strange things. Mm -hmm. and, um, that was a direct response to that mm -hmm. show. And now, just recently in Vienna, we have uh, been able to see a similar project that was dealing with Soviet, well, Soviet modernist architecture and it was also research that was going on for several years. Um, and um, through all of these researches, it's coming out that the history of architecture, the history of modern architecture, should be rewritten because um, this modern architectural history that was written several years ago by Kenneth Fenton is simply missing out these territories where important things were also going on and important concepts for modern architecture in general. Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting. So how would you compare actually the Soviet, the, 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 the projects about the Soviet architecture and this project, uh, Finnish modernization, which is about the Yugoslavian architecture? 
there were very similar conclusions at the end too. It's, I mean, we were, of course, we are local here and we are familiar with this architecture and we know uh, how <coughs> architects were uh, studying and looking at things and what were their main, uh, let's say, um, examples of the or mm -hmm. I, We know that things were, that there was not uh, a war and mm -hmm. things were going on different way in the West and you know, yeah. here, but there were instant connections and uh, exchange of uh, knowledge through media, through, uh, through, through, ex through joint expert work as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, also Soviet Union was not such a hermetically closed country at the end. Um, people were reading Western magazines, uh, they, were, they were developing similar concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see that the, this project uh, in Vienna was about uh, all the countries of ex-Soviet Union except Russia and you could see that they were developing its own regional way of modernism and we can say that for any country practically you know, and also for Yugoslavia. I heard that about Addis Ababa actually for Ethiopia. Or, or Addis Ababa. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, what is also interesting that uh, I mean, many photographers were dealing with the uh, monuments, Yugoslav uh, revolutionary uh, monuments of uh, the revolution in Yugoslavia. So, uh, which are even more programmatic, I would say, in iconography than than uh, ordinary buildings, you know, with a purpose. So, how could you? I mean, what I what I noticed with most of the most of the monuments is that they, they are very modernist in its structure, but usually the, the decoration and the paintings on them, like the mosaics or the, or the frescoes, are basically socialist realism. Even in, 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 in Yugoslavia somewhere, for instance in Drajbaše, you know, where you have the mosaics of uh, Iva Šubic inside this modern structure. Did you include these two in your research in unfinished modernizations? Uh, it was included in the research, yes. Uh, uh, ideology and architecture was one of the particular topics. And, uh, it is, of course, clear that politics was behind this architecture, but it was basically behind it in a way to promote progress. Uh, and it was not trying to include, at least from 1948, when uh, Tito broke up with Stalin in Yugoslavia, it, was, it is clear that no one was interfering with uh, the aesthetics of, uh, of architecture from, from the political side. And the architects were really free in a way to, to develop it. And um, uh, they were just dealing with ordinary modern question of the For example, the relation of architecture to nature. Mm -hmm. Many of these monuments are placed in a very nice natural landscapes. That was the obvious basic questions for most of those monuments. How to place uh, something in the environment, something in, in, into an unspoiled nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what about, uh, I mean, uh, what I noticed here yeah, also about your series, you basically didn't include the, the monuments. Uh, of the revolution. I mean, basically they are everywhere, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. You concentrated mostly on the, on the cities, actually, urban, urban yeah. areas. Yeah, While the, in Yugoslavia, most of the monuments are on the sites of the battles of World War II, yeah. actually. So, uh, was this like... Uh, uh, is this the reason you didn't include these monuments? I mean, they're very popular. Again, they're very popular for the past five, six years, I would say, yeah, in the photography. There was a, I think a photographer from Belgium has uh, published a book, it is called Spomanik. Uh, yeah. The Young Campus, I think, mm -hmm. is yeah. the one, yeah, 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 I've seen that book, yeah. That's right, and uh, no, I was interested in these uh, urban concepts, architecture, I was never thinking on the monuments. Mm -hmm. Maybe, also, maybe I didn't know that they are so spectacular. So sometimes also things you don't know, <laughs> but but they wouldn't fit into my work. Yeah, yeah, of course no. Because I'm asking because it was uh, it's when we are talking about the programmatic uh, mm -hmm. uh, programmatic uh, 
uh, you know, concepts of architecture that they're basically they're like a church. Sometimes you know the churches they had very very programmatic structure. You know, where is the Jesus? Where where the uh, apostles and, and all all this all this. Uh, uh, people, so in, in the in the monuments you have like very uh, strict, actually, like no iconographic structure. Uh, so yeah, we are coming towards the end, so we need to uh, slowly open the exhibition and have some wine. But before we do that, uh, I would just like uh, if you can tell something more about the the book. So the the book is was published uh, last year or in 2011. Yes, by Hadia uh, Hans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, it is mostly, uh, mm, uh, what's actually for you, uh, what is the difference, for instance, to, to, to present uh, the images in a book or on an exhibition, you know, some of the images are like huge here and it seems they need to be, some of them. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think uh, there are, of course, two different things, book and exhibition. Uh, in the book you are somehow limited, but you can reach more people. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course the concept of the book is also uh, to follow the groups I was telling before. Um, at first I had the idea to, to make it uh, somehow topographically go from the north to the south of Europe, or to sort the countries uh, somehow together, but that was a, not a good concept. I, I was in the, so the uh, row, uh, the order of the pictures is uh, uh, based on these uh, different groups and also on an aesthetical perception. And um, it's also not easy to find a publisher for a book yeah. like, like this because nobody knew that the, uh, this will be somehow successful because the item, the topic, uh, many people don't like and the publisher really uh, took a risk to publish the book and it became quite popular and it sold out in the first edition and uh, was reprinted and also I was uh, lucky not to pay for the book because you have to know as photographers many of the books you see which are published are somehow sponsored because it's a really tough business, uh, this uh, uh, making uh, books in photography. And so many photographers bring the money to uh, have a book to, to be printed. And uh, that was not necessary in uh, this case. And so the design of the book did a colleague of mine on the fac faculty in Bielefeld. And we were talking and trying to find out a concept. And of course, uh, the more possibilities you have in an exhibition because you can also uh, scale the images in a different size and uh, I like this big scale in the particular in uh, this kind of photography and it would be nice to have them all in this scale but <laughs> it's not possible we are limited in money and space and uh, uh, it was important for the work and also for the exhibition to, to show many pictures because one picture is not telling the whole story. You, you you have to have the series. You have to have the repetition of the same, and to discover the difference in the same. And so it has to be a lot of photographs. So I decided to have 70 photographs in the book and 35 in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. Cool. So it's uh, you mentioned the. It was reprinted. So, what was what is the print run actually of the book? Two, two, I'm curious. Two thousand in the first and also in the second. Oh, okay, that's quite quite a, quite a large number for photographic. It's a best time. <laughs> for photography book, I would say. Yeah. Just a minute. <laughs> okay, so če če mám dělat kopa šání, by by se povádlo da prášete naše dva gosta. Uh, okay, uh, no question. So, uh, uh, in, in this case, uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Honinger, Correct. right? Yes, uh, to, to have a, a short speech to open the, the exhibition. Yes, the, the yes. maybe he got out from the corner. Yeah, maybe he's <laughs> a little bit in front. Well, first of all, good evening. Uh, 
As we already said, my name is Hendrik Joninger. I'm the director of the German Cultural Center in Slovenia. And uh, we have had the honor to bring that exhibition the second time already to Slovenia. Because uh, one year ago, uh, Maribor was European capital. And uh, we had the pleasure to exhibit Roman's photos in Maribor. And afterwards, uh, they were traveling from Maribor to the capital of Slovakia, to Bratislava, then to the European capital, Kočice, in Slovakia, and back again to Ljubljana, but now the capital. And we are quite happy and very thankful to Photon that we exhibit these photos here in the center of the town. And thank you also again to Mateusz, was already very well known in the framework of the Goethe Institute with a lot of activities. Now let me let me just point out two or three things. Um, you three were discussing or speaking about the outstanding values of the photos. Of course I totally agree. Documentary value, artistic value, uh, technical value. But one thing I learned is very, for me, very surprising. I remember um, a kind of small event in Maribor. There were a lot of photos, especially the big format. And uh, two elderly visitors came to the photos, seen the photos, uh, and didn't know what to say. Uh, some tears were rolling because documentary photography normally is maybe concrete or a little bit grey. Uh, concrete is not uh, talking, but these photos have an enormous emotional impact. Mm -hmm. Emotional impact, and year and year and year and every year, this emotional impact will go up. Mm -hmm. Not only of the demographic <laughs> uh, development. And I think this is something what makes these photos very precious. And uh, maybe for you as Slovenians, uh, you already know this wonderful golden building. Uh, and uh, I guess there are also some very high emotions connected maybe to that building, of positive or negative. So we are very proud to show them here. And uh, I would like uh, to invite you uh, to have a conversation with that photos, maybe you will uh, discover more things that has been discussed here in that round. Thank you very much again. Uh, it's your uh, task to open the exhibition, not my one. And thanks from Goethe Institute again, and thanks to Jelen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hvala.